Hello everyone and welcome back to my series on Small Business Server 2003. In my last video we went through the kind of boring and complex install of Small Business Server 2003 and when we ended up we were greeted with the complete your configuration uh, tasks that you have to do at the end of your Small Business Server installation. So today we're going to go ahead, or in this video at least, we are going to go ahead and complete the post install configuration. So as you can see here, Small Business Server kind of gives you a nice little to-do list and all you've really got to do is follow through. You don't have to pay complete close attention to them, um, but some of them are more important than others. So let's get started. So the first one we have on our list is view security best practices. So this is just a little help file that you can read through that's going to give you the best practices for securing your small business server. So things like uh, configuring backup and making sure that you've got password complexity and monitoring enabled. So if we were deploying this in a production environment, it would definitely be worth giving that a read through. Um, however, as as of recording this video it is October 2020 and Small Business Server is getting on probably close to 17 years old. Uh, I don't think we're going to be deploying this in any production environment and if we were then we would really need to sit down and uh, consider what we're doing. This video series is literally about um, exploring Small Business Server 2003 and building out a quick test lab. It is for nothing more than that really. So I think we can check the done on that best practice there. Okay, so the next item on the list is the connect to internet wizard. Now, this is kind of going to be different to your scenario. So in this series, we are using a single network card to our small business server and it sits on a local area network. But I think I mentioned it in the install video that in you can actually have two different types of network scenarios here. So you can have your small business server sat on a local area network like we're, we're doing and you can have it uh, use a external router um, or you can actually have small business server be your router and that can be it can sit behind another router and act as a as a extra firewall or you can use small business server um, as a dial-on-demand connection, meaning you have a dial-up uh, network and you can share that to your local area network. In this scenario, we're going to be using it uh, just sat on a local area network, so we can go ahead and start this wizard. So here we have welcome to welcome to the configure email and internet connection wizard. So I'm going to hit next, and you see here immediately we're we're presented with these two options so we've got broadband or dial-up because remember that in 2003 dial-up was still out there it wasn't necessarily used for businesses that much um, but it was still around so for this we're going to select broadband because we're actually using the VMware virtual networks so I'm going to hit broadband and click next so here is where those two different scenarios that I was telling you about really come into play. So here you can see we've got my server uses and we can select our broadband type. So you can actually connect this direct to a cable modem and it can use PPTOE to act as your router. You can say it has a direct broadband connection so it's connected directly to a router, another router but nothing else is going to connect to that, that edge router or you, is, as we're going to use, a local router device with an IP address, which is going to be our scenario here. So I'm going to click next. And now we're asked a few questions about our, our local area network to our router. So we're asked for our ISP's preferred and alternate DNS servers. Now, nine times out of 10, you're going to use Google for this. And you can use trip, uh, 8.8.8.8 or 8.8.4.4 and then you need to put the IP address of your local router. Now for us we're using the VMware virtual networks that's 192.168.128.254 and if you're following that scenario with me 
you can actually use your virtual network editor to set this up. So under NAT settings, you can set that up. So now we've got the IP address. You can see we've got this checkbox here. My server uses a single network connection for both internet access and local local network. As mentioned, that's what we're using. So I'm going to leave that checked and I'm going to click next. Now we get this this scary looking box come up. Only one network adapter configured for use. As a result, firewall protected small business server cannot be configured. Without a firewall, it's basically saying with one network connection, you can't use the inbuilt firewall in small business server. You need to use an external firewall. That's fine by us because we've got that on our edge router. So we're going to click yes and we can close out of that. So the next thing we're asked here is what web services do we want to publish to the outside world? Now, by default, you've got Outlook Web Axe, Remote Web Space, and all of the rest is unchecked. Uh, but you can check to enable all of them. So in this scenario, we're going to check to enable all of them. But this is really something you want to sit down and work out. So do you want your internal internet site to be published and access to the outside world? Bear in mind that all of these you, you need to log in to be able to view, but it's it's up to you in how you want to secure your, your network really from the outside world. In our lab environment, we don't really care because we're sat behind a few firewalls at this point. So, or at least I'd hope you are. So I'm gonna hit next. And now you can see we're getting a little warning about this. Are we sure we want to publish all of our web directories? Uh, we're going to hit yes for this one. And in this next um, box here, it's going to generate a um, self-signed SSL certificate. Now, in a production environment, you definitely want to use a, a paid for um, certificate. But um, in a lab environment, we don't really want to spend any money and it would be kind of pointless anyway. So we're going to leave it with the self-signed. And what we need to do here is input a web address that the outside world is going to use to get to our small business server. So for us, that's remote.designcore.biz. And once that's in, that is what you would type in if this was a real world scenario to get to your small business server. I'm going to hit next. Now, this next uh, box is kind of confusing for me because why would you change it from the top option? Because most people that are buying small business server want to use uh, Microsoft Exchange. That's the main selling point. This uh, box here basically set, um, it disables or enables Microsoft Exchange from sending and receiving external mail. So if you had this set to disable internet email, you would only be able to send mail between intern, internal users. There'd be no external mail. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of pointless. And I think the real reason they did this is in 2008 onwards with Small Business Server, they had both an Essentials version and a Standard version. The Essentials version basically didn't have Exchange and handled a few things differently. So I think this is kind of both the Essentials and the Standard Edition rolled into one. So we're going to leave it with Internet Mail enabled and hit next. And you can see here it's asking us now what our email delivery method is going to be. So for us, we are going to use DNS. So this is basically in your domain name, you would have an MX record. And this MX record would then point, in our case, to remote.designcore.biz. And the, the World Wide Web would then distribute mail using that. But for smaller businesses that, say, don't have a proper business broadband connection, a lot of broadband connections might actually reject this traffic. So the other option there is to, to forward email uh, through an ISP. And that can be something called a smart host, which is essentially um, you direct email. Um, when someone sends an email internally, it would then go out to your ISP's mail servers and say, hey, can you deliver this on my behalf? And at that point, it would then deliver. It would then use a secure and trusted server to deliver your mail. Lab scenario, we don't really care, so we're just going to leave it on DNS and click next. So the next screen is, uh, sorry, the last screen, just to clarify, is how you want to send mail. This screen is how you want to receive it. So 
back in the 2003 to 2005 era, there were kind of two ways that people would use Microsoft Exchange to receive mail. Um, the first, which is the more common one, which is basically to receive uh, mail directly to Microsoft Exchange using SMTP. And that that's fine, um, and that works fine. Uh, the other method is you can use, like with uh, sending mail, you can receive it from your ISP's SMTP server, which was kind of more of a secure way of doing it and was a lot more trusted. Uh, but the third way is to use a POP3 connector, which basically means you have a mailbox hosted by, say, like a hosting company, which receives all of your mail from your domain, regardless of who's it, who is it to. And then what that the exchange server does is it picks up all of that mail, pulls it all in, and then distributes it towards your various users. And a lot of small business servers actually went for that scenario because if your internet went down, you could still receive mail. You'd just have to wait till your exchange server became back online and you can then receive your mail through POP3. So a lot of small businesses that didn't have the world's most reliable broadband chose that option. Um, a lot of large businesses uh, that say use exchange outside of small business server would then use just direct to the server or something like that but we're not really going to be receiving external mail so I'm just going to leave this as default and click next. So in the next screen we're asked what is our domain name to use with exchange so this is going to be designcore.biz quite simple with that so say the user Bob, he would have Bob at designcore.biz. I'm going to click next. Next we've got a screen that allows us to remove uh, sort of dodgy um, attachments that are coming into emails. This was some like very early anti-spam and anti-phishing. So this is things like Visual Basic code, access files, batch files, things like that. We're not really worried about this for a lab environment, so I'm going to hit next. And now you can see we're finished, we get a brief summary and we can click finish. And it's going to go ahead and configure all the options we just put in. Okay, so now you can see that the internet email and configuration has completed, so that's, another, that's the first thing we can check off the list. So now, as soon as you do that, you're going to get this, um, this pop-up message. Now, when Microsoft built Small Business Server, you've got to bear in mind it's kind of built for business owners that are a little bit tech savvy, but don't necessarily know IT inside and out. So this uh, box here is basically saying, hey, you've now published to the outside world. You kind of might want to put some password complexity on at this point. So at this point, we're going to hit yes, and we're going to enable the complexity. Um, and you can actually choose to delay the password um, complexity rollout, but we can just do it now because there's no users yet. Um, it's recommended that password policies are after all the Yeah, we just put them on now. And there we go. And now we can say it's basically prompting us to do some Windows updates. So as you can see, Small Business Server really kinds of prop kinds. Uh, tries to prompt us all the way through to make sure we're being secure so it was kind of good for like small business owners well hence the name really um, it's tried to then open the um, Windows update website but as you can see we've got internet connectivity but it's really kind of old and doesn't load anymore so it's fine we don't really care so that's another thing checked off the list and the next one is configure remote access. So yes, hit start on that. And welcome to configure remote access. So this is kind of VPNing into your company. It's not essential, but it's most companies are going to going to try and want want to use this if they're going to have people out on the road and things like that. So to begin, we're going to hit next. We're going to enable remote access, and we're going to check VPN access. Basically, if you don't want to enable this, you don't run this wizard. So we're going to hit next. It's going to double check the remote server name. That's correct for us. So we're going to hit next. And then we're going to hit finish. And it's going to go ahead and configure this for us. It's really that simple. And you see that went through rather quick. I didn't even need to pause the recording. So that's the next thing we can check off the list. We can hit the done. Ooh, 
I didn't even know you could click that and it would check it for you. That's something new. The next option is probably going to be quite interesting for uh, a lot of lab users, and that is activate your server. So remember in the previous video we skipped putting the product key in. Now, one little disclaimer here is I use only legit software and if I am using ISO files, I'm using ISO files that I've created from legit disks. Uh, I don't use any pirated software or if I'm using any software I don't have a license for, I'm using an evaluation. So in this video, I actually do have a valid license that I'm going to use. So I'm going to pop my key in now. Okay, so I put my key in here. I'm obviously not going to show that with you guys. If you do want to keep a lab going for a long period of time, then you might want to go on to eBay because I know a lot of companies sell off their old licenses. I'm not saying that's the most legit thing to do in the world, but if you're only using it for a lab environment, you're not really committing piracy at that point. So, you know, I, I can sort of uh, condone that. But as I said, I don't do any kind of software piracy when it comes to labs. So I'm going to hit the update button and it's going to take my key and guess what, I put the wrong one in. That is because I put a premium additional small business server key in and not the standard. So I'm going to go ahead and put my right key in this time. Okay, so now I put the right key in this time. I'm going to hit retry and it liked the key. So let's try and activate. It might not even allow us to activate such an old operating system, but let's give it a go anyway. Yep, unable to uh, communicate with activation servers, but I have a legit key, I paid for the license, so that's in. The lab will stop working eventually, but you know, we have we probably won't be using it for this long, and as it's for testing, we're okay at that point. Add additional client access licenses. So this is kind of a wizard where you can go through and add additional client access licenses. Um, Small business server, I believe, comes with five, and you can have up to 25 users. Um, yeah, for a lab, absolutely fine. The next option is these are kind of management tasks. So we've completed the first section, which is like the setup options here. So in the next um, sort of section, these are like common management tasks, but it's kind of prompting you to do them now before you start using your server. So the first thing we're going to do is add a printer. So obviously we don't have a physical printer, but I find if it's kind of useful to have a fake printer there just so to make the lab a little bit more real. So I'm going to go through and add this now. So we're going to create a new port. It's a TCP IP port. And uh, we'll do it on 192.168.128.31. So that's usually around the IP address range that I usually use for a small business network so one is usually the server 254 is the router um, uh, tw uh, 20 to 30 is usually switches and things and access points and then 31 up to 40 is my is usually printers and other things like that and then I have the DHCP range from 50 onwards so I'm gonna hit next Okay, and we're going to use a generic network card, and we're going to hit finish. So now we've created the port, we can now select what type of printer it is, and it's a HP laser jet. Four thousand. And we can call this office printer. Then we're prompted to add a share name, I'm just going to leave this as office location office uh, side desk and then we're going to hit next we don't want to print a test page because it won't actually print and we can do finish it's going to copy over the driver and we're done so that's another thing we can check off the list so the next uh, item in the list is add users and computers so we can do this so we're going to hit start on this task Welcome to the Add Users Wizard. Um, here gives an out, out overline of what, what it's going to do for us. We're going to hit Next. So 
one thing that you get in small business server that you don't get in like full blown Active Directory networks is you get user templates, which are really handy stuff to have. So we're going to go ahead and use the standard user template here. And we're going to hit next and we're going to add a new user. So the owner of this virtual company is David Gibson and we can change the logon name to D Gibson. And what's really kind of cool is once you've selected that login name in that drop down box, it will remember which one you chose. So when you come to add your next user, it will it will format that name all by itself, which is probably one of my favorite things about Small Business Server. If we had a telephone number, we can put it in here and we can then put in a password. I'm only going to add the one user for now, um, but then I'm going to hit next. Do we want to set up a computer now? So this is basically creating the computer object in Active Directory ready for us. So I'm going to hit next and it's going to suggest a computer name. We're going to go ahead and rename this. We're going to call this Design Core PC01. So when when a computer, the when when David comes to join his computer, it's going to suggest, is it this one you're working on? And if you say yes, it will rename the PC if it's not the right name. And it will also deploy a load of applications, which I think is really cool with small business server. So it will actually deploy applications to client PCs. I'm going to hit next. It's going to ask us what software we want to deploy. So in another video, we're going to go ahead and deploy newer uh, or more software packages. But built in, we have client operating system service packs. So that is like service pack free for um, Windows 2000 and I think service pack 2 for XP. We're going to leave all of these checked and we're going to go um, do so during the client setup, allow applications to be modified. We're not going to check that. After client setup is finished, log off the computer. We're not going to check that either. So we could go under advanced and we can also set other things up. So we can set up printers, um, remote desktops, things like that. I haven't really played with that too much. Um, we can also edit applications, which is something we're going to do in another video. I'm going to hit next. So these are two other things that you might want to push out. So um, connection manager, we definitely want. So that is, say you have a laptop joined to your small business server network that roams outside of the office. The connection manager installs the VPN client automatically and configures it so that when the laptop's outside the office, it's really easy to connect. Um, Active Sync, um, you could use if you're using, say, like Windows CE devices and things like that. Never really caught on that, really. So we're just going to leave that unchecked and click next. For connection manager to work, the remote, so this is basically saying you must have run the remote access wizard. We already have, so we can click OK. And there we go. We have now configured our first user, and it's going to go ahead and complete it. So this. Um, message that we're seeing here to finish the client computer setup you need to navigate to this URL in in Internet Explorer and it will connect the PC we're going to deal with that in another video so for now we're going to click OK and as you can see we've now um, we have now configured our um, our client computer our, or our user account so we're going to click close on that do you want to run this wizard again to add more users? Not quite yet. We're going to check no for that. And we can check that one off the list. Next one we're going to do is configure server monitoring. So yet start this one. Okay, so welcome to monitoring configuration wizard. We're going to hit next. So here is this is basically going to send you a report of how your network is doing. It was really handy for, say, small business owners because um, you could literally see, hey, I've got updates that need to be done on my server. Um, but equally, it was also useful for, say, like IT support companies, like where I used to work. So we would set up to get these reports, say, weekly, and we would then use that to say, hey, you guys need to update your software, or your backup's been failing, or something like that. So we're going to check both of these for now, and we're going to hit next. So 
this is a external email address where you would like to receive your um, your alerts to. So I'm going to set this to SBS at the uh, at retro server guy uk. So I'm going to get a report for that. And now you can select who inside the business you want to get this to get these messages. So we're going to select David Gibson as he's the manager of this virtual company. We're going to add him and we're going to hit next. So you can also get um, sent performance um, performance errors as well. So for say like um, services that have stopped things like that, which were really handy back in the day. Um, for this scenario, I'm not going to bother with it, but we're going to hit next. And then we get a brief overview of what we've selected. And we're going to hit finish, and it's going to go ahead and configure this for us. And as you can see, we've now finished the monitoring wizard, and we can click close, and we can check that off the list. The last thing on the on the list I would kind of say is optional, and the reason I say that is optional, not because you shouldn't be backing up your data, you always should, um, but because a lot of companies that were putting in small business server m used things like tape drives back in the day. So they would come in every morning. They put, say, if they came in on a Monday, they would put mon um, they would put Monday's tape in, and then say like at seven o'clock on a Monday. Uh, that backup would then run, and then in the morning they'd come, they'd come in to find the tape had been ejected, but was just hanging out the drive to uh, to say that the backup was done. Um, that's fine, but for that you really used something like Veritas or Symantec Backup Exec um, to do complex tape backups. So a lot of companies that had tape solutions were not using the inbuilt backup with Small Business Server. The other thing companies did is they purchased like three or four um, USB hard drives or zip drives, something like that, and they alternated them on, say, like a weekly basis or something and took one home. Again, that's totally secure. Um, it's easier to recover as well. So in this scenario, we are going to be using an external drive. So I'm going to hit start on this, and we're going to go through to the server backup configuration wizard. I'm going to hit next. And now it's asking us where we want to store our uh, backups. Store backups on a local hard drive or network share. We can see tape is grayed out because we don't have a tape. Uh, it's saying here we could not detect a tape drive. Um, so in this scenario, we are going to use a backup drive. Now, we have an extra hard drive, but it's currently not formatted. So we're going to go ahead and quickly format this drive. In later versions of Small Business Server, it actually did this for you. And now we can see our new drive. It's a 400 gig drive. And I'm going to go ahead and format it. And I'm going to call it Backup. We're going to perform a quick uh, format. And yeah, let's put compression on for this so we get a bit more space. Okay, so the backup drive is now done, and that's F, so I'm going to put in the F drive to store the backups. Now it's asking us, by default, all information required to be successfully restored from your computer is backed up, but we can exclude stuff. So by default, it's going to include all of the drives, um, but it's also excluding the F drive backup files. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and just exclude the entire F drive because there's nothing on that we want to back up. So as you can see here, we've got our C drive and our E drive and we're excluding the backup drive because we would just be put into a infinite backup loop of doom where it's trying to back up the stuff it's just backed up and it just really wouldn't work. I've seen that before. Um, so now we're going to hit next. Now it's going to ask us when we want to perform our backups. So by default, it's going to put it on just weekdays because if you imagine when the data is going to be um, changed the most, is it going to be on weekdays or is it going to be on um, every day? So it's up to you at this point. We're going to st say store a maximum of 10 backups. So we've got a little bit more of a retention 
and we're going to start our backup at 5 o'clock. I'm going to hit next. So retain copies of permanently deleted emails. We're going to keep 30 days. Yep, that's fine. Uh, enable periodic snapshots of users' shared files. Yep, these are all fine for us. In a Back in the day, they might have chosen something a little bit different, but that's good for us. Next, um, again, we get a little summary, and we're going to hit finish, and you can see that it has now um, finished our configuring our backup. So I'm going to hit close, and we can check off the last item on the list. So as you can see now, we've finished every item on our little to-do list. We're going to hit close, and we are now done with the post-install configuration. We can hit start and open up the server manager and in the next video we are going to get started navigating around the uh, small business server management console. Thank you very much for watching this video.